Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Mini Tribes One Kingdom. It's your good buddy John here with today's video. And today we are continuing our summary of the entire Bible, continuing with the book of Judges. So stay tuned. All right, Book of Judges. This book plays out almost like an ancient soap opera, I like to say. It's very cyclical. So the cycle goes like this. Israel rebels against God. God turns them over to one of their enemies. They repent and cry out to God, and God raises up a judge to deliver the people. Now, if you're thinking of a guy in a robe with a powdered wig and a gavel, that's wrong. These judges are not the typical judges you would think of. These are military generals, almost pseudo-kings. So this book is set after Joshua conquers the Promised Land, but before the beginning of the monarchy in Israel. So aside from God himself, the judges were the de facto leaders of the nation. So let's get straight into the book. It's set between 1400 BC and approximately 11 or about 10, uh, 12th or 11th century BC, somewhere around there. I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, but somewhere probably about 1000 years before Christ is probably where the book ends. So the book be opens with some of the conquests of the land. Judah claims their land along with Simeon. However, the people fail to drive out the Canaanites as God commanded them to do. Therefore, God says that he will not do it for them. The Canaanites will remain as a test for Israel. After Joshua and his generation die, the people fall into sin. God hands them over to the king of Mesopotamia, Kushan Rishaphim. I apologize greatly for my butchering of that name. When the people repent, God sends the first judge, Ophniel, the nephew of Caleb. You guys remember Caleb? Not the Caleb of this channel. <laughs> I'll, I'll just keep with the summary. Under his leadership, the people are freed from their Mesopotamian oppressors. After Ophniel's death, the people again sin against God. They go after foreign gods and... That's the main sin, but they also give in to other sins as well. This time, they are handed over to the Moabites under the kingship of Eglon. For 18 years, they serve him, but then God raises up Ehud. The story of the confrontation between Ehud and Eglon is actually kind of comical. Ehud is described as a left-handed man, and so he's able to smuggle a short sword, almost a dagger, into Eglon's presence while pre presenting the king with tribute. After the tribute, Ehud states that he has a message for King Eglon. Now, Eglon is described as a very overweight man. He is an overweight king. He makes his guards leave the room, and when Ehud says the message is from God, Eglon starts to stand up. Seizing his opportunity, Ehud draws his sword and stabs Eglon in his great belly. Actually, his sword gets stuck, so Ehud leaves without it. Eglon dies in his palace bathroom, and the servants do not realize it for some time because they believe he's just, he's just relieving himself. So Ehud is able to escape and leads the Israelites in battle against the Moabites, delivering the people for quite some time. The book also briefly mentions Shamgar after this, an Israelite who kills 600 Philistines with an ox goad. When Israel next sins, God hands them over to Jabin, a Canaanite king, and his merciless general, Sisera. When Israel again repents, God sends Deborah. She is unique amongst the judges because she doesn't actually lead Israel in battle, but she does bring the word of God to the people. She summons Baruch and orders him to rebel against Jabin and Sisera. He gathers Israel, but refuses to go without Deborah's help. She agrees, but tells him that he will not be the one to take Sisera's life because he wouldn't go. Instead, a woman will be the one who ends the life of Sisera. During the battle, Sisera's chariots are soundly defeated and hunted down by Israel. Sisera himself escapes on foot and comes across Heber and his wife Jael. These are some people that he was familiar with. Jael agrees to hide Sisera 
and when the general falls asleep inside their tent, she kills him by driving the tent peg into his skull with a hammer. What follows is a song sung by Deborah and Baruch about the victory God has brought them. Once again, Israel finds peace for a time. When Israel next sins, see what I mean by this being very cyclical? They are handed over to the Midianites. When they cry out, God rebukes them for their fickle loyalty. Still, he raises up Gideon to deliver them. Gideon isn't what you'd describe as a hero or a military leader of any kind. You would probably be better, to, better set to describe him as a coward in a way. That's how many people have described him. When God comes to him, he's hiding in the threshing floor of his father. Still, God assures Gideon that he is with him. First, he will destroy the altar of Baal, a false idol that Israelites were worshipping. In fact, this was an altar that belonged to his own father. At night, Gideon tears down Baal's altar, cuts down the Asherah tree, and sacrifices his father's bull to Yahweh, the only true God. When the people of the city threaten to kill him, his father actually comes to his defense, stating that if Baal really was a god, he could defend himself. Baal, Baal, however you want to pronounce his name. So Gideon is renamed Jeroboam by his father. Gideon gathers an army of about 32,000 men to go to war, but God informs him that his army is too large. Midian has over 135,000 soldiers. Gideon's army may become prideful if they won against such a force. Gideon sends home anyone who's afraid, only leaving 10,000 Israelites to go to war. But that's still too many. To thin the numbers, God has Gideon take the remaining soldiers to the water for a drink. Of his men, 300 cup their hands in the water and raise it to their mouths. These will be the ones God uses to deliver Israel from Midian. At night, Gideon sneaks down to the Midianite camp and hears one of the soldiers relate a dream which his fellow soldier interprets to mean that Gideon is coming and will soon defeat Midian. Taking his soldiers and dividing them into three groups, Gideon has them surround the enemy camp, break empty pictures, and shout with a loud voice. The Midianites believe they are under attack and begin to panic. God throws them into such confusion that they start to slaughter one another. The entire army is defeated and the two princes of the Midianites are killed. Gideon pursues the remainder of the Midianites, but several towns he passes refuse to give provisions to his tired men. He eventually captures the two kings of Midian and, call, and decides to kill them when he discovers that they killed his brothers. He also punishes the towns, which refuse to help him. Gideon has a very large family, 70 sons in total. After his death, one of his sons, Abimelech, has all of his brothers killed so that he can become king. One son, Jotham, manages to survive. He publicly calls out Abimelech and reminds the people of all Gideon did for them before fleeing. After ruling for a time in Shechem, Abimelech is at war. Gaul leads a rebellion against him, causing Abimelech to pursue him. During a siege, Abimelech is killed. What happens is a woman drops a stone from the top of a building he was trying to burn down. The stone crushes him, and he orders his armor bearer to kill him so that he will not be remembered as having been killed by a woman. The next judge is Tola. There is nothing significant recorded about his time as judge except that he was from Issachar. Then comes Jer as the next judge. He is noted for having 30 sons who each ruled over a city. Israel again falls into sin, serving the various gods of the people around them. So God hands them over to the Philistines and the Ammonites. For 18 years, they are oppressed. When they cry out to God, he sternly rebukes them. He had warned them what would happen if they had followed other gods, but they decided they didn't want to listen. He delivered them from each group that tried to destroy them, from Egypt to Moab to Midian, but they still forsook him for pagan idols. So God tells them to call out to these worthless idols they traded him for, since he clearly wasn't enough for them. But Israel continues to cry out, and they get rid of their idols, so God eventually decides to rescue them. 
This is where Jephtha enters the story. He was the son of a prostitute whose half-brothers got rid of him to keep him from inheriting from their father. He became something like a mob boss, but when Gilead needed help, needed help, they begged him to come back. Gilead is where he's from, by the way. After some debate, he agreed if they would make him their ruler. So he goes to war with the Ammonites after a failed peace negotiation. While fighting, Jephtha vows to give the first thing to greet him when he comes home to God. After his victory, it is his daughter who greets him. She comes out with joy. She comes out dancing and singing because her father had won a great victory, his only child. Heartbroken, Jephthah fulfills his foolish vow. A war also breaks out between Jephthah and the tribe of Ephraim after the victory over Ammon. Jephthah kills the Ephraimites and judges for another six years. Ibzan is the next judge. This guy also had a very large family, 30 sons and 30 daughters. Then came Elon, whom we know next to nothing about. Abdon was the next judge, and he had 40 sons and 30 grandsons. The last major judge of the book is Samson. We all know Samson for his well-renowned immense strength. We know Samson as a kid as one of the great heroes of the Bible. He is another miracle child like Isaac, given to a man named Manoah and his barren wife by the Lord. From his birth, he was to be a Nazarite. However, Samson had a major weakness, his lust for Philistine women. At the time of his birth, Israel was under Philistine control because, surprise, surprise, they abandoned God for sin. One day, Samson decides to marry a Philistine woman. During the wedding, he arrogantly proposes a riddle, which the Philistines cheat to win by convincing his wife to give them the answer. Samson kills several Philistines to pay his debt, but his wife is given to another man. Enraged, Samson destroys the crops of the Philistines. In response, they kill his wife. Samson slaughters many Philistines throughout his lifetime, serving as judge for about 20 years. When they attempt to capture him, he breaks free and kills them with the jawbone of a donkey. Another time, he takes an entire city's gate and walks away so they can't hold him back. But do you remember what I said? Samson had a weakness for Philistine women, and his next partner would be Delilah. She is convinced by the Philistine lords to betray Samson and discover how he is so strong. For a while, he refuses to tell her, but eventually he gives in and tells her that if his hair would be cut, his immense strength would leave him. In his sleep, Delilah has him shaved, and the Philistine rulers gouge out his eyes and take him as a prisoner. But when they bring him out as a trophy during one of their festivals to their idols, God returns his strength to him for one more time. Samson makes the building collapse, killing all present, including himself. The last part of the book shows how the average people in Israel behaved at the time of the judges. One such man is Micah, whose mother makes him an idol to worship. A Levite agrees to serve him and participates in his idolatry as a priest. But a coalition of soldiers from Dan steal the idols and convince Micah's priest to abandon him for them. This shows how far the Israelites had fallen from God. They were fighting over who got to possess the idols of pagan gods instead of destroying such things. The last portion is arguably the most unsettling part of the book, if not all of scripture. And I'm going to go ahead and give an obligatory warning. If you are easily triggered by certain subjects such as sexual assault and violence, maybe be careful listening to this part. A Levite man, his concubine, and his servant are journeying home. They stay in a town in the territory of Benjamin called Gibeah, but the inhabitants want to sodomize the man. In fear, he and the homeowner he was staying with give them the concubine, and the men of Benjamin spend the entire night gang raping and abusing her to death. In the morning, she is dead. Her husband takes her body home, cuts it into 12 pieces, and sends them throughout Israel as a witness to what Gibeah has done. Israel is enraged and goes to war against Benjamin. After two days of defeat, they crush the Benjamite troops and desolate the tribe down to 600 people. In horror, they realize that Benjamin will now die out because they have all made a foolish vow to not allow the Benjamites to marry into their families. However, through some scheming and more crimes against God, they find wives for the Benjamites to replenish their tribe. 
This is where the book of Judges ends. Not a very high note at all. And something that is repeatedly said throughout the book is there was no king in Israel at this time and each man did as he seemed as he felt was right. Judges is a very dark and sad book. Let's discuss its themes. It shows how sin has even infected the lives of God's chosen people. We are shown that no human is perfect. Many of the judges had their own moral shortcomings. Just look at Jephthah's actions or look at Samson's actions. But Judges also points forward to Jesus. While judges like Jephthah and Samson had their own flaws, they point to a future judge who will act rightly. God's people have shown that they need constant guidance from the Lord in order to stay on the right path. Without this guidance, Israel behaves like Micah and the men of Gibeah, a very strict cautionary tale we should all be aware of. Ultimately, Judges points to Jesus. He will be this perfect judge who leads all of humanity in righteousness and victory over all of God's enemies. This is the book of Judges. So, <coughs> mm, sorry. I want to thank you guys for taking the time to listen to this summary of the book of Judges. Just a few announcements before we end this video. Uh, we are still collecting money for Destiny's GoFundMe to help her buy a Braille note, which is the device I use to read these scripts. So if you'd like to help Destiny go to college and you'd like to uh, help her be able to do everything that I'm able to do, then please consider donating. The link will be in the description below as always. The other thing is we are still running our MTOK Summer Challenge. So if you'd like to win one of our pack jackets, just be sure to subscribe, share this video with others. We still have a month and a half before we pick a winner. So thank you guys for watching this video. Subscribe if you liked it. Subscribe if you're new. Have a great day and God bless you.